you referred to BDS before, boycott, divestment, sanctions. You're a Jewish man. Um, I want you to say a little bit more word, uh, a little bit more about that, about the congressional resolution that's before the the U.S. Congress right now. That's going to penalize companies and organizations and individuals who support BDS. Why should Americans who care about justice, who maybe care about Israel, who care about human rights, support BDS? Well, you know, Jewish Voice for Peace, which is one of the fastest growing Jewish groups in the world, has just come out officially in support of BDS for the first time, the Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions campaign. So it's increasingly moving into the mainstream. And the reason that it is moving into the mainstream is because Palestinians who have called for BDS, issuing their first formal call, I believe in 2005, have no ability to deter Israel's occupation and project of apartheid except through violence. Um, and violence has been a part of every national campaign and anti-colonial movement uh, since, I think, the dawn of time. But most people prefer a nonviolent means of resisting and giving Palestinians a way to push back against their own dispossession. And so BDS came into the picture for um, people in the West, and it's a way of being in solidarity with Palestinians by uh, demonstrating non-compliance with the pro-Israel consensus, which has been imposed on us through this powerful lobbying juggernaut and through the bipartisan foreign policy elites in Washington. Um, and what BDS has been able to do so far, I think, is achieve a shift in consciousness by putting this discussion on the table. And so when people have done, for example, flash mobs in supermarkets. Hello, hello, baby, I have got to have a word. I saw this on your shopping list, so you must not have heard. You must not have heard. You must not have heard. I saw this on your shopping list, so you must not have heard. Stop fighting, stop fighting, don't fight. Stop running, try to don't fight too. which were selling Sabra Hummus, owned by the Strauss Group, which contributes money to the Israeli uh, elite uh, Gulani and Givati brigades of the Israeli army. They're putting that discussion on the table for people in the supermarket who are wondering, what the hell are these ladies doing dancing in front of the checkout aisles? What is this hummus? What is the Israeli army doing? Uh, when I'm being brought to a campus, or Ali Abu Nima is being brought to a campus to speak at a divestment hearing where the students have put a resolution on the table before the Student Governing Council that the school should no longer do business with corporations that are active in the occupied West Bank. It's forcing the whole student body to engage this question. Mm -hmm. And so BDS has forced the debate at every level of society to the point where, as I mentioned before, Congress has had to introduce legislation to prevent BDS from actually coming into, f into play in the corporate world. Uh, they're actually trying to legislate it out of existence. So obviously we've won the debate. The question is where is it going to lead to? Because it's not just boycott, it's divestment, which takes place at the company level, and sanctions, which would take place at the government level. What sanctions do we want? I'm an opponent of sanctioning uh, you know, the targets of American regime change, because it typically winds up hurt, well, aside from the destructive impact of regime change, it typically winds up hurting average people in these countries. But if you simply refuse to sell Israel parts for its F-16s, they won't be able to fly. And what do those F-15s and F-16s do? Well, they're pretty much bombing concrete block apartments in the Gaza Strip that house multiple families. 
and they won't be able to do those kind of operations anymore, it's something that is going to start to bring them to the table. So we need to start seeing those sanctions on military parts. And I think, you know, it's a way, it's, 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 it's a ways away, but it's heading in that direction. It's, it has changed the consciousness and it's, be, and it's been effective. I mean, uh, uh, that's the argument, isn't it? That uh, the world community has asked Palestinians they said, Israel doesn't have a dialogue partner, and all Palestinians can do is respond violently. They call for a nonviolent resistance, and yet that's rejected too. What does the world community really want Palestinians to do? They want them to disappear. Well, I saw Bernie Sanders say on Twitter that while well, he, oppo <clears throat> he opposes the anti-BDS legislation, which is a good first step, but he also opposes BDS. And so I commented in the thread, I said, name one other mechanism Americans can use to oppose Israel's project of apartheid uh, short of you know Congress doing something. What can Americans do? Name one thing Americans can do uh, to impose a price tag on Israel's project of apartheid. And there's, I know that Bernie Sanders would not be able to answer that question because there is nothing else that we can do as citizens. No, for sure. I think of the march in Gaza, for example, I mean, here, here we have how many weeks now of Gazans marching nonviolently uh, to, a, to a, a, a border that Israel has defined, and uh, they're being shot indiscriminately, picked off by snipers. And yet, this is exactly what the world community has asked of Palestinians, protest nonviolently. And yet, the world community stands by silently while each Friday, Gazans are picked off one by one by one. You know, um, I read a Thomas Friedman column at the dawn of the Arab Spring about how Palestinians could take advantage of the moment. And he said that if they would just have a giant march that was totally nonviolent, and they would march to the wall uh, and demand uh, that they have the right to vote and that they could have a democracy and they hold signs calling for uh, you know, their rights, that Israelis would meet them on the other side, and that the only reason that Israelis wouldn't do this is because uh, Palestinians had resorted to violence. And so they have the Great March of Return, and, you know, they were throwing rocks, they were burning tires, you know, they're going up against a nuclear-armed military with a blue water navy uh, that has infinite supplies of non of, of less lethal weaponry as well. And they're cut down by the hundreds. And the UN today issued a report finding that journalists were specifically targeted despite identifying themselves as journalists, like Yasser Murtaja, who was a very prominent journalist. I can tell you from being in the Gaza Strip, his work was prolific. People really knew who he was and had defined himself and he was killed with a press vest on. Um, so the Great March of Return really exposed the whole fraud that uh, Western media pundits and the US government and some defenders of Israel, especially liberal Zionists, had always preached, which is that if Palestinians would just use nonviolent means or the means of Gandhi, kind of civil resistance, that they could finally get their rights it just shows what Israel really is about, which is denying Palestinians basic, uh, basic rights and justice because they're Palestinians, because they're not Jewish and Israel has to be a Jewish state in order to define itself. That's what the Great March of Return exposed, but it has also produced results. Um, conditions have slightly improved in the Gaza Strip because Israel couldn't take the PR disaster the march caused for them. Um, and actually, the use of burning kites uh, towards the end of the march, when people were killed, they sought to retaliate by lighting kites on fire and sending them to the other side, which would burn crops and some other things that were completely expendable in Israeli society. They had a deterrent effect. Israel started to allow aid from Qatar in they started to negotiate in exchange for these marches ending. And Palestinians, common Palestinians, understood that. We want more than four hours of electricity a day. Um, now they have that, and it's because they died by the hundreds, but they should not have to do that. 
uh, and it's up to us to make a sacrifice, whether it's risking our jobs, risking things that are so much less than risking our entire lives so that they don't have to do that anymore. Uh, what are we willing to give up and what are we willing to sacrifice so that they don't have to do that? Justice.